for their face, even though I know that not everybody can do that. So whoever can, that's great. I appreciate it. So why don't we go ahead and we will start um, with our blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher bachar banu mikol hamim venatan lanu et torato Baruch atah Adonai noten haTorah. This week's parsha is parsha chukat. The word chukat means the chok of, and a chok is a kind of law that has no. Um, rational explanation, which doesn't mean that it's irrational. It means that it's super rational, understood by the creator of the universe and not by us. And this chok that we're talking about in this week's Parsha is about the para aduma, the red heifer. And the red heifer, which was burned and taken along with hyssop and cedar, was put together in water that was sprinkled on someone who had come into contact with the dead. The person who prepared the mixture themselves became ritually impure and the person who got sprinkled became pure. And it's like, we don't understand that there's nothing that we can't understand it, which doesn't keep us from exploring it. So what I want to talk about today is really based on a collection of a number of different commentators and people who address the whole Parsha, what's going on in this Parsha. First of all, we need to know when the Parsha takes place, which is surprisingly in the 40th year of the Jewish people. So it skips, 38 years are skipped. The Torah is silent about what was going on during that time. And we join in in the 40th year before they're getting ready to cross into the land of Israel. We know this for a number of ways. That's like, how do you know it's in the 40th year? Two critical events happen, which is the death of Miriam and the death of Aaron. So both of the, those people pass away. And um, it's obviously that happened at the end of, the, of their time. And at the way the Parsha concludes was what I included in the email, which is that the Jewish people are camped on right outside my window on the other side across the Jordan on the plains of Moab facing Jericho, which is what I see when I look right outside my window right here. So it's so thrilling. So that's where they were. And that's where we know they were when they crossed the Jordan to come into the land of Israel. So this is in the 40th year. So what we're going to talk about today is um, are a number of topics, but they all revolve around the same idea. We're going to talk about death but not so much death itself, but what it signifies and what its, what its impact is on the living. What is the impact of death on the living? We're going to talk about the emotional impact, the psychological and spiritual impact. We're gonna talk about that along with other life changes and transitions and how we negotiate and navigate those. And this Parsha is about that. And so we're going to take a look at, instead of just looking at the red heifer and that chok, we're going to really broaden it and talk about the chok being this thing that we can't really understand. What can we really not understand? We can't really understand life. As I say in Hebrew, bichlal. We don't even understand how is it that we have such a significant, meaningful existence during the years or time that we are allotted in this world, and then, and then it all goes away. What do we do when we're confronted with that, quite frankly, bizarre reality? What's the emotional impact? What's the spiritual impact? And what do we need to do in order to navigate that? Because we know that death is, as, as people often say, Death is everybody knows that they're going to die, but we just don't believe it's going to happen to me. It's like, it's going to happen to other people. How did that happen? But not me. Because we need to have some sort of a veiled protection that allows us to have our life. Otherwise, as someone said, you would cry when a baby was born because pretty soon they're going to die. Because soon, you know, they're just headed for the grave. So what else are you going to do? And it can so distort our approach to life and living 
when we are confronted with death. And so this is what happens with when our world is shaken, whether it is during transitions, whether it is death of loved ones, our own impend our own mortality, all of these things that shake us up, how do we navigate that? And the, the Parsha is about that and it's about the shaking up. So I actually want to start with um, something that, that it's, it's, it's sad for me to, to have read it, but um, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory, who now himself has passed away, wrote about when his father died. And that when his father died, he was affected and impacted emotionally for a very, very long time, far beyond like what you're, quote, supposed to be impacted by. And he said, and he wrote that during that time, that he was not proud of himself and he did not elaborate. He said he made some of the biggest mistakes of his life. Now, I don't know what those were, but the way he behaved, whatever it is he did, he said he, he went off, like off the rails. And that this is somebody who obviously was a clearly balanced, psychological, psychologically balanced person. Said, but he completely became an emotional wreck and it impacted every part of his life. So why was he talking about it? He was talking about it in the context of Moshe. So that we know that if we go, let's turn to page 843, or those who are not um, with the with the with the Hamish, pay, we are on chapter 20, verse 1, page 843. And what we're going to see is Miriam's death. The children of Israel, verse 1. The whole assembly arrived at the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people settled in Kadesh. Miriam died there, and she was buried there. There was no water for the assembly, and they gathered against Moses and Aaron. The people quarreled with Moshe and said, spoke up saying, if only we had perished, blah, 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 and they're going on. Why have you brought the congregation of Hashem to this wilderness to die there? we and our animals. And why did you have us ascend from Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Not a place of seed or fig or grape or pomegranate and there is no water to drink. This was, how are they saying this? This is in the 40th year. We already have been down this road, but what has happened is Miriam has died. And so there's two things going on. They're getting ready to go into the land of Israel. And before people get ready to do something very big and major, they often come unglued emotionally. I'm even thinking, you know, if you, if you remember yourself maybe as a senior of high school, in high school, and you start, I don't know, maybe you were acting out with your parents as you're getting ready to kind of cut those ties and you're kind of scared, but you want the independence, but you don't know what's going to happen. And things are, there's that turmoil. It says, for 38 years, the Jews were not complaining about anything. And then in the, they complained at the beginning when they first left Egypt, and they complained at the end. So lest we think, well, they've just been complaining that whole time. They weren't complaining that whole time. They only were complaining and having this like, what are we doing? Maybe we should go back. Why is this happening? This only starts fomenting and kind of percolating up when they are on the cusp of a transition. Even though the transition is good, the transition going from Mitzrayim, from Egypt to go into the wilderness and to be have Hashem and not be slaves anymore, that's a good thing. But you know, when they do, um, they have you count points of stresses in your life and they talk about moving, losing your job, getting a job, having a child, God forbid, lose all these things. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. What matters is that it's profound. And that unnerves us, that it, it, it shakes us up. So, so the Jewish people were shaken by the fact that they were on the verge of going into the land of Israel. That was very challenging for them. And the truth is, I have to say, if I was on the other side of the Jordan River looking at where we live, I'd be shaken up too. I'd be like, seriously? How's that going to work? You know, there are Canaanites here, that land. We've been existing on manna. We've had Miriam's well. We've had the clouds of glory. We've had God's imminent presence. What This is going to be really scary. What's this going to look like? So they were shaken up. Added into this for Moshe and Aaron, they just lost their sister. So we tend to think like Moshe is the leader of the Jewish people. And he's dealt with their complaints before at the beginning. 
And he does not do anything that goes against what God wants him to do. But in this moment, he does. In this moment, and he gets very emotional in the things that he says to the Jewish people. He's never spoken to them like this before. What does he say um, to them? Page 845, chapter 20, verse 9. Moses took the staff from before Hashem as he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, O rebels, shall we bring forth water for you from this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock with his staff twice. Abundant water came forth in the assembly, and their animals drank. So God allows the miracle to happen, but Moshe, since when does he call them rebels? He's never called them rebels. If anything, he's always defended them to God. So he he is, he, he's, I don't, I don't want to say he lost it because we are not here to judge that, but he is not himself. And then something else, when it says that he struck the rock, is he, he was told to strike the rock 40 years earlier when they first left Egypt, he was told to strike the rock, but he does something here that's a little different. It says he raised his arm and struck the rock. Now, to me, that is like an emotional outburst. If somebody raises their hand like to hit somebody, it's the raising of the hand that is almost more frightening than the actual hit. It's like, it's like this person is ready to act with anger. That is anger. Striking the rock can be without raising your hand, but raising your hand is an act of, that is an act of aggression. That's, the, that's an act of anger and emotional. That's an emotional outburst. So in this moment, it says, and we know that Miriam had just died because that's what it just said, that she had just died. It says, he's grieving. So this is what Rabbi Sachs was saying, is he was grieving. Carol. Yeah, this happens to be my bat mitzvah portion, this, that exact part that you talked about. So aside from calling them rebels, he was saying, shall we, Aaron and I, get water for you. He's not attributing it to God, the miracle. And Ex that Nachmanides said was the reason he didn't go into the promised land. Very good. Very, I mean, very bad that he said that and very good. Exactly. Yeah. And that's out of character too. Because other times when he, when the people were upset, he has said, who are we? We're like dust and ashes and we're nothing and it's all God. And why are you saying this? He had Korach's rebellion. He had the spies. He, he's an experienced, seasoned leader who right at this moment now is a human being in grief. And when we are in grief and we're dealing with the reality of that, you know, it doesn't matter that you were up on Mount Sinai for 120 days like an angel and not... Um, drinking or eating is like all of that kind of goes out the window when it's you when it's you and your grief and your situation your transition all bets are off and so here's this person who becomes then a role model of humanity and for us to understand ourselves and other people as well that when people are grieving or when people are going through a transition and they're acting a certain way, not, I mean, obviously we're all supposed to, we're responsible and we're, and we're accountable and all that, but we need to cut people some slack of what happens to a person's, um, what happens to their center that they become, they, bec they come off. And this is Moshe, that happened to Moshe, and not that I'm not comparing Rabbi Sachs to Moshe Rabbeinu, but he certainly is in our generation, a person who represents like the, the cultured, refined, dignified, put together, never a scandal, never a nothing ever about him. And he was saying he made the biggest mistakes of his life. So we have to understand and appreciate what the confrontation with death does to a person. And so there was at the time with the Torah, when we had the Beit HaMikdash, is that there was a ceremony. There was a ceremony that helped a person get re-rooted in this world. To be able to make an appropriate separation between themselves and the person who is now in the next world. And to realign their, it's like, like recalibrating 
you know, you know, every time you change your ink on your printers, it's like you have to recalibrate and print out this thing. And it has this like, because you like, you messed with it. Like you have to be recalibrated. And so this is a, it was a mechanism that existed for the Jewish people in order to recalibrate them emotionally and spiritually because what it does to a person. Because when we're confronted with death, it makes us question the value of life. It's like, you know, if it's gonna just be like this, then I should just like do whatever I want. Or you're telling me that my life is so valuable, it's over in an instant and then I'm buried and that's it. What does that mean? How do I restore the appropriate relationship that I have? And that's what that was about, is this process with the red heifer. So Miriam passes away, then Aaron passes away, and then Moshe's the baby brother. Oh, and by the way, Moshe and Aaron are both told, you will not go into the land of Israel. So in a way, they were both given, they were given their death sentence. They were told, I mean, every again, everyone knows that they're going to pass away, but most of us don't like to be told exactly when. It's like, and it's, you're not going in. So, and it's not like he passed away young. He was 120, but still, that doesn't matter. It's like at my age and some of the ages, like, I remember my grandmother, I remember my grandmother's 65th birthday. I'm just saying, and I thought she was really old at that time. And now I'm like, no, that's actually pretty young. So when you're 120, I don't think he never said he thought of himself as like an old man. It said that his eyes were not dim. His strength did not lessen. He, I don't know, maybe he felt like he was 18. I don't know what he felt like, but he wasn't looking to say, you know, been there, done that. I wasn't really looking to take these people into the land of Israel anyway. So fine, that's fine with me. He didn't say that. And we know that he davened over and over and over again to be able to be allowed in. So he was not looking to have his life end. So to be given this, like his life is ending, Aaron has passed away, Miriam passes away, the people are freaking out, the people are going through what is really any kind of a transition, which is a mini death. Because by definition, it's letting go of one stage in order to be able to embrace another. And that is never easy. They didn't talk about, you know, with kids, like little kids, that it's hard for them to let go of an activity. They're playing with their truck or they're playing with whatever, they're, whatever. And they're like, okay, we're going to be cleaning everything up in about five minutes and we'll be getting ready to go on to the next thing. And for some people, it's, you know, it takes a lot because of the transition. So the Jewish people are on the verge of a huge transition. So they immediately start bringing out the, why did you take us out of Egypt? Mind you, the people who left Egypt are no longer alive because by the 40th year, they had basically all died. So the people who are saying this were never even in Egypt. Okay, so it's like, what are you even talking about? So they're raising things that they're going completely out of control. So here, basically, we have a whole people, each for their own personal reasons, the, the collective reason of everybody freaking out. So then something strange happens and God act, responds in a very unusual way and sends a very specific kind of punishment to the Jewish people. So he does punish the... Um, he does punish Moshe and Aaron and say, you're not going to go into the land of Egypt. But then the people also have on page 849, this is chapter 21, verse four. And it says, oh, let's, see, let's go verse five. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why did you bring us up from Egypt to die in this wilderness where there's no food and no water and our soul is disgusted with this unsubstantial food? So then they're complaining about the manna, saying it's insubstantial. So they can't say it's inadequate because it was adequate. They can't say that it's not available because it is available. They were like, you know, it's just not doing it for us. That's basically what they were saying. It's just not doing it for us. It's insubstantial. That's a very strange complaint. And what happens, it says, verse uh, six, God sent the fiery serpents against the people and they bit the people. A large multitude of Israel died. The people came to Moshe and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against Hashem and against you. Pray to Hashem that he removed from us the serpent. 
Moshe prayed for the people. Hashem said to Moshe, and here is the, the remedy, make yourself a fiery serpent and place it on a pole, and it will be that anyone who was bitten will look at it and live. Moses made a serpent of copper and placed it on the pole, so it was that if the serpent bit a man, he would stare at the copper serpent and live. Okay, this is your first homeopathic thing where you take the bite of the, you know, you take the thing that's causing the problem and you don't get rid of it. So it says the people asked Moshe, get rid of the serpent. And God doesn't get rid of the serpent. Now the serpent, the word here is actually the word that's used is nachash. So nachash might sound familiar, it should sound familiar. This is the same as in the Garden of Eden, nachash. Okay, so this is Hold on one sec, excuse me. <clears throat> this Nachash, and let's just find it in the text so that you can see it here. Uh, let's see, verse six is in the, in the plural. It's the second word in the Hebrew from the right-hand side, eight hanichashim. So that's plural of Nachash. Nachash is the serpent. It's the snake that was in the Garden of Eden. And that's what God says. Now, some you might think like, oh, well, the reason it's in fiery serpents is they're in the desert and that's what you would expect to be there. Marlon, yes. Um, it's an interesting symbol because it is the symbol of modern day medicine today. The snake, yes, on, you know, so uh, I love that, how that works. I love that. And it yeah. is, it's the symbol of healing. And you're like, of all things, you know, you think it'd be like an aloe plant or something, you know, like, you know, like, I don't know, a snake, but the snake wrapped on the pole is taken from here. Snake wrapped on the pole is a symbol of healing for a number of different health organizations um, use that. So it's pretty universally recognized. And it's weird because one would normally associate a snake or a serpent or anything in that category with representing health. So the question is, why would that be the representation of health? Again, not an aloe plant, you know, not tofu. I mean, it's a snake. So why is that a symbol of health and that God wanted it? Etta. I think I remember that um, Moshe tells Aaron to put a copper snake uh, figure on the staff and it stops the plague. Yes, exactly. So that was exactly that part that we just read that he put oh. made a, ser a serpent of copper, a snake of copper and placed it on the pole. So now why was it placed on the pole? What did that do? So how is, what did that look like then? Like Aaron caduceus. has, yeah. go ahead, Etta. What were you going to say? The caduceus, you know, is the medical symbol of the staff with the snake around it. Right. It's and that comes from this, that comes from, from the Torah here. But the question is, why would that be healing? So what's interesting is the reason it was on a pole is so that it would be high in the sky. Okay, it wasn't just hold out a copper snake like in front of your face. It was put it on a pole and it said when they looked at it, so why would it be? Because that doesn't make, really make so much sense either. So it says he would stare at the copper serpent and live. What does that do? You stare at a copper serpent and live. What does that mean? So think about what this is. If what the, first of all, what the serpent itself represents. So the serpent was biting them and killing them. The serpent is clearly the Nachash is connected to the Yetzir Hara, the evil inclination, the Satan, you can call it the impediment, the impediment, the thing that impedes us in whatever category it might be. So it's what impedes us, that's the Nachash. So the people said, get rid of the Nachash for, for us. And God is like, no, we're not getting rid of it. Just like we don't get rid of it. Susan, person. Uh, well, you were asking why it was on a pole. I'm just thinking it had to be high up so a lot of people could see it at one time. Great. And so it was a crowd of people and maybe that's the factor in following the wrong direction is that you're following the crowd. Very, okay, that's good. I had not even thought of that. That sounds great. And a lot of people would be looking up at it mm -hmm. and the fact that they were looking up at it. So what were they really, when you look up, like anything you're looking up at at the sky, 
So we're going to understood, understand the sky in a more metaphorical way. Just like when we say, you know, if you ask little children, you know, where's Hashem? Or even some of us adults, like where's God? And people point up, okay? Up in the sky there someplace. We associate the expanse of the sky. We say the Shemayim, the heavens. So if you look at the, you take the snake, you take the Nachash, which is the symbol of that which impedes us. And what impedes us? What impedes us and gets us on off track is when we lose sight of Hashem in the picture. And when we lose sight of Hashem in the picture, then we've got our something biting at our heels. That's like we're vulnerable to attack and we don't have a way to cope. So even purely, so they just had to stare at it. As an individual, they would stare at it. So yes, they were also as people, but it, it says specifically. And so, so if it was that if a serpent bit a man, an individual person, he would stare at the copper serpent and live. So it's kind of like, if you got bit by the Nachash, like if you and you like get bit by the Nachash, it's not just, I got bit by a serpent. It means I got bit by what the Nachash represents which is that there is something other than Hashem who is running the world, that there's some other reality that is at play, that there is some, something other, which is what the Nachash represented in the Garden of Eden. That was, that, was a, that was the test. Yes, Janice, why don't you unmute so I can. I find this very interesting that it could be taken as an idol. As, as an idol. Okay, so yes and no, because they're certainly not worshiping it. But what they're doing is they're taking the, what the Nachash represents, which is the um, physicality, the physical world, all the temptations, all the, all the negativity is represented by the Nachash. You put it on a pole and you hold it up against the sky. What you're doing is you're putting the Nachash in a context. You're saying, you're just the Nachash. You're the Nachash, and then there's all of God's reality. So in the reality of everything, the Nachash on the pole, and it's confined, you know, it's like wrapped on a stick. That's not exactly a powerful, that's the opposite of being powerful. Being a snake wrapped on a stick, being held up, is the opposite of powerful. Powerful and all-encompassing, all-expansive, that's the sky that the pole was held up with. This is, we're not trying to get rid of desires. We're not trying to get rid of the negativity or that aspect. We're trying to put it in its proper context. So we know this and we've over the years, but we always have to kind of remind ourselves that when we say the Shema and we say you should love Hashem, it says b'chol levavcha and it should be v'chol libcha. It should be with all of your heart, but it has, Levavcha, it has two bets. Lamed bet bet chav. They say it's because you should serve Hashem, you should love God with both of your hearts, with your evil inclination and with your good inclination. And anything that is an, a negative aspect about ourselves can be channeled and put into an appropriate context. All of our mitos, all the things, the aspects of us is. Anger, anger has a place. Stinginess has a place. Arrogance has a place. All of these things, they're, they're called amida is because they're measured. They're measured. So the measurement of that is to keep the nachash in the context of God's reality. To tell the nachash, you yourself exist in the context of God. There isn't, there isn't an other to God. Everything is in the context of being enveloped by God's reality. And you, Nachash, play a role, and your role may be only to give us the power of choice. So it says when a person would stare at it, what do you do when you stare at something? It doesn't say, you know, glance up at it. It's like, stare at that. Take that in and take it to heart and be like, oh, yeah, what was I thinking? You know, people say, like, you just... Look at me and take a good look and then you like and and you'll understand something. Take a good look at that nachash 
and understand what it is you're really dealing with as a human being, what those forces are. And it was an externalized picture of our internal struggles. That's what the Nachash represented in the Garden of Eden. It was an external symbol of our internal struggles. So God's like, I'm not getting rid of it. I can't get rid of it. Then you will no longer have free choice. What I can tell you is how to relate to it. And I'm going to tell you how to relate to it by it's going to be in copper and it's going to be on a pole and you'll look up at it. And then we have the beautiful, beautiful gematria that the gematria of Nachash is the same as Mashiach, the same as Messiah. It's like, like how do you get that? Like, because that's what Mashiach will be. Mashiach will be that all of our, our aspect of us that's Nachash, everything that's getting in our way, will be channeled and put in the right framework and context and will bring us happiness. So the Nachash will turn into, not the Nachash, the Nachash is not turning into Mashiach. The Nachash challenge is going to actually bring Mashiach. That's what will bring the redemption because we have to be able to choose it. We can't say, take it away. So the people says, that's why it says that then they would live. That's, what, that's why it said that they would be able to live. So with this, we have like these fiery serpents, we have the dealing with death. We have the dealing with um, our emotional response to it. And how can we understand the preciousness of our life? And like, why does anything I do matter? Because look at them, like they're gone. It didn't matter. It's like, it does matter. Because the person who is passing away, we also have to have the proper understanding, which is that they too, they too are, have transitioned not in today's world of what people are calling transitioning. This is transitioning from this world to the world to come. And they're not gone. They too are in a larger context of God's reality. And that is what helps us get back into proper focus. So the para aduma, this red heifer, this cow, this calf, which has never had a yoke on it, pure red, you know, there are a couple of them around the world that the, they're keeping to be ready for when the third temple is rebuilt because everyone's going to need to be sprinkled with those waters because we've all come into contact with death and we've all been impacted by it um, to one extent or another. It says, here you take this animal and you burn it to ash. It says, what does that represent? It's like, it's the op ultimate, you were there and now you're not there. Now you're not there. It's nothing but ash. Well, that is like the antithesis of existence. To say something is nothing but dust and ashes means it barely has any reality to it. And then it's mixed with living waters. So even the ash then is put into the context of living waters and that's what's sprinkled on you. So it's not, we'll just take some, it's not like a baptism. It's not like, oh, we'll just put some, sprinkle some water on you. The water itself has to have some of the ash in it because that's the reality is that what you see as being nothing is really going on to the next stage, the next level, and you need to as well. And that was part of the rehabilitative process that would happen for people. And that would restore their emotional and spiritual equilibrium. So you might think like, you know, I've come into contact with death and I'm perfectly fine, said, says everybody about themselves. I'm perfectly fine. So it's like, no, we're not. Uh, so we can only, we are limited in what kind of uh, spiritual connection we can have because we have been touched by what death does to our mental and spiritual state. We have been. And it's not because it's bad. And it's not because death is a taboo. It's, it has nothing to do with that. It's because we don't understand it. And ultimately, it says, that's the hope. What don't I understand? I cannot really understand death. And therefore, I can't fully understand life. I need help with that. And the greatest people needed help with that. Moshe needed help. Aaron needed help. Rabbi Sachs needed help. We all need help with that because it, it 
it jostles us as do again all transitions which are like a mini death because they all require leaving one place and going to something else and letting go and going to the next stage is very hard and so everybody to one extent or another grapples with that and that's you know sometimes people it's interesting sometimes people intentionally try to transition to something else thinking that that will solve their problems you know, I remember this was many, many years ago in, in one of my previous incarnations when I worked at a bank, um, there was a woman and she and her husband were having marital problems. And it was like, and then I was so shocked when they decided they were going to move to to Washington and they were going to build a house and they moved to Washington. I thought, this is probably not a good idea. And it wasn't, it, it didn't last. They, 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 that didn't do anything. Moving someplace else and trying to say like, oh, we're starting over. It's like, no, you take it with you. You take it with you, whatever it, whatever it is. So the, the transitions that we go through, we should appreciate them. We should appreciate the transitions that other people go through as well of what people grapple with and how it might affect them emotionally and spiritually and the challenges that it brings with them. So this Parsha of Kukat, I would say is probably one of the most I, th I mean, obviously the Torah is all about being a human being, but I think it's probably one of the most human faces that we see of our leadership, of Moshe, Aaron, the people, and how people like really behave in real life situations. And that the, the, the healing comes from the copper snake and this para aduma which both in their own way, put the death, put the challenge in the context that includes God. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that they made the serpent, they made the nachash out of copper. So what's the word for copper? So let's just go back to that. Um, it says what they made the, the nachash out of. So hold on one second. So if you look at verse nine, it says, Vayas Moshe, Nechash Nechoshet. So the word for copper is Nechoshet. Well, the root of that is Nachash. So the, <coughs> it's the same word, Nun Chet Shin. So the copper itself says is like snake like. It's like, what does that mean? So think about what is copper. Of all of the metals, where does copper rate? Where does it rate? If someone said, I went to the Olympics and I won the copper medal. Mazel tov, I don't think so. Okay, so copper is useful. So one of the rabbis I read said, pennies were made out of copper. But that's not a silver dollar. No one says, oh, I have a copper dollar. It's like, okay, good for you. It's like, its value is in its functionality. Like it's only to make change, you know? And the cop things that are made out of copper are for usefulness. They don't have inherent, it's so, I'm not saying they have no value. It's not inherently valuable. It says the nachash, the nachoshet, the copper there is really based on the idea that we're supposed to understand the physical world, the physical challenges, our desires, all of our different qualities, even the ones that we call negative, that they have a function. They have something that they're there to help us achieve something, but we're not supposed to turn it into the main thing that we're doing. So desire is important. It's functional, like copper, like a penny. Anger has a place, but it's like copper. It's like a penny. It has a use, but it's not the main point. So a copper coin in the context of, in, of silver and gold, you have to have it in its proper place. So now that I'm sure there's somebody who's collected pennies or whatever, actually my mother's late husband, a blessed memory had, I don't know how many pennies he had. He had so many pennies. The grandsons were all like, can I have this penny collection? So. But, okay, but other than that, this is the nachash is nechoshet. And it's meant to teach us what the role is 
so that we can better appreciate it. When we understand that, it kind of demystifies it. Also, a snake that's up on a pole can't bite you. Where are snakes dangerous? When they're slithering around on the ground and they jump out and get you. But if you have them up on a pole and you've got them, literally you're holding the serpent by its tail, you've got the serpent, the serpent doesn't have you. And that in and of itself was part of the healing that went on for the people. So this Parsha provides not only the challenge, but also the antidote. You wanna live, you wanna be able to live with the challenges, the transitions, the losses that come as part of being a human being in this world. It's a chok, you'll never totally understand it, but I'm gonna give you things that will help you navigate it. And that's what this Parsha is all about. And interesting, this Parsha is always read right around the time of the 17th of Tammuz, which will be next week. So next week, um, we'll meet on Wednesday, the 17th of Tammuz, start, it's, even though it starts Wednesday night, the fast will be on next Thursday, um, is, starts the three weeks in the beginning of going into the preparation for Tisha B'Av, and so a very challenging time of Jewish history and Jewish present reality. It's like we need a cushion before we go into those three weeks so that we don't despair because you could get a little depressed um, just thinking about all the things that Jewish people have been through. It's like, what is the point? It says, first we'll give you Parsha Chukat. First we'll give you this Parsha that tells us what the antidote is to all of these challenges. So God willing, we'll be able to be strengthened by this, even once we realize that these challenges, it's not just for people who are you know, lesser, that it affects everyone to the extent, again, that Rabbi Sachs was saying that, that Moshe's behavior can really only be attributed to the fact that he was in such tremendous grief and that, um, that he was so challenged by that and that he related so well to it. So God willing, our, our challenges, our transitions will be ones that will only be for the good, but the truth is they're all for the good and that life is, life is good. It's all Mayim Chaim. It's all living waters and the ashes are diluted in the water. The copper snake is against the blue to chelet of the sky to show us exactly what the context is. So we don't have the answers but we do have an understanding and an understanding is what can help us get through the challenges that we face. All right, ladies, happy to answer any questions or hear any thoughts that you wanna share. Yes, Patricia. Um, I'm thinking back to, wasn't it the copper mirrors that the women gave to make the bowl? Yes. And exactly. so I was just kind of trying to puzzle that through of the copper being something useful as a mirror and then transformed into something that was kind of used for a holy purpose. Absolutely. So it's, it's because it's, so that's exactly, thank you. That's a very good um, segue because it wasn't that the cop, in fact, not only wasn't the copper valuable in and of itself, Moshe's initial response was it was negative because it was used for the women to beautify themselves. He's like, not thinking that really belongs in the context of the, of the Mishkan. And God was like, you missed the whole point. That's what copper is, is when something is useful, it can go one way or the other. It could have been something, you're right. It could have been, you know, God forbid, like prostitutes lining up and just checking their lipstick before they walk out on Colfax. Then you're right, that would be terrible. But they used it to strengthen the relationship with their husbands in order to create the Jewish people and to maintain faith and trust. So in a way, what the, the, the copper tells you what the true intent is of the person using it because you can say oh well it's gold it's silver it's inherently valuable it's like no it's not it's useful so what will be judged by is what did you do with it 
So we can't say it, it takes away the, um, not the pretense, it takes away the externals and strips it down to what exactly are your intentions and what did you do with it? So even like the Yetzir Hara, we say it's a tool. That's, that's why the Satan is set, called an angel of God. The Satan works for God as a tool to give us free choice. It's just a tool. When we elevate it and turn it into like, oh no, this is what it is. This is like what I worship. It's like, you really miss the point. It's a tool in order to help us. As much as in a game, the other team is there to, you know, to give you a game in order to score the point because nobody's coming to the game if you just run down the field and, and you know, with nobody else on the field and just kick the ball over the goal line. That's nothing. So you have to have an opposing force in order to create the reality that we live in to give us the benefit. So thank you, Patricia. That was actually very good. Susan. I'm also thinking about the um, mourner's cottage and how it puts death in the context of God. Great. And in, and in fact, the mourner's cottage doesn't even mention the word death. Right. Right. There is no death mentioned. All it is, is exactly right. Which is why a mourner receives merit for saying that Kaddish. Because the mourner is the person who has the opportunity and is struggling with belief in God at a time that is so challenging. And so when they affirm God's great, Yisgadal v'yisgadash shemei rabah, Yitzgadal is God's name will become great. Yitzgadal will be holy. Shemei Rabbah, his great name. And everything is about the greatness of God. And so someone who can say that, that confers merit on them. And then by connection to merit to the person for whom they are saying it. But Kaddish, we've talked about this before. Kaddish is not a, uh, a one-stop shop thing. There are other ways. Anytime a person does a mitzvah, in memory of somebody, they are affirming their belief in Hashem, which is elevates the neshama of the person they are doing it in memory of. So all of that, but yes, the Kaddish, which is why it always has bothered me. I, I wrote an article, I think it was for the Jewish News, a long time ago, saying that I was always bothered by the tone with which the Kaddish is said, Jules, Yisgadal, Yisgadal, Shemei Rabbah. Great and sanctified is the name of God. I'm like, are you listening to the words you're saying have nothing to do with the tone of voice that you're using? So it should be, it's a glorious, you know, effusive praise of God in this context. And it does the same thing. It's the same thing. It's putting the loss in the context of God's all encompassing existence. And that's the healing. That is the healing. So thank you. That's a very good point. Also, anything else that comes to mind that you think, Janice? Yes. Um, I was wondering, is there anything you could first talk about why? Abraham, I mean, not Abraham, Aaron wasn't allowed to go into the land of Israel. There's a discussion about why Moshe wasn't. For the same thing, they because they acted together, because this is Moshe and Aaron. So even though it says Moshe is the one who said, you rebels, they were they did it together. And so they were held accountable with each other. There is some discussion that maybe was some like hold over from the sin of the golden calf, kind of like a, in abeyance, you know, like when you, what is a suspended sentence or something. So, but there's, yeah. I don't know so much more about Aaron, but he is he's put together because the two of them were working as a team. Yeah, well, trying to imagine what that must be like, you know, your whole, you know, the past 40 years, you didn't want, you know, for Moshe, he really didn't want to do what he was asked to do. And then the reward at the end, he was... Now, to, you know, to, 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 to. so, you know, and I think, you know, we talked about it at Pesach is just to also remember that um, 
Nobody said actually ever that he was going to take them in. We just assumed that because the gematria of the names of Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam are Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, and Na'asev and Ishma, we will do and we will say. I mean, we will do and we will listen, which means their job description was, those are pretty two major events to be in charge of, exodus from Egypt and Mount Sinai. That was Moshe, Miriam, and Aaron as the three of them. They were a threesome. In a way, it's like, it wasn't a given. We think it's a given, like, but that's not fair. He was, that's not fair. So obviously it was part of the plan, but there are many who say it wasn't going to happen going back longer than longer before this moment, that, that things just kind of, it was more an accumulation. So it's very tricky, very difficult to understand. And people are, Jewish people are always so compassionate. They're like, that's not fair to Moshe after all he did for Godly to took care of the people for all these years. It's like not fair that he doesn't get to go in. So, um, but God says, you know, and then Parsha Viet Hanan, that he davened, that said he davened whatever the gematria is, Viet Hanan, that many times. And the God said, if you do it, say one more time, I'm going to have to let you in. I'll have to answer your prayer and it won't be good for you. It won't be good. Um, so even Moshe, again, you can be a, a prophet, the greatest prophet, um, that there is still the, to be able to say is just because you're a prophet doesn't mean that you're exempt from being a human being and that God had to say, you're like a parent would say, I'll let, I could let you do it, but it's not going to be good for you. I'm telling you, it's not going to be the right thing for you. You think, well, if he was a prophet, how come he didn't know that? It's like, because there's also the self. There is the actual individual person that is at play as well. And thank God for this, right? I mean, we don't need leaders who are demigods. That's not inspiring because we're not demigods. So how am I supposed to be inspired by somebody who's godlike? They were human beings beyond our comprehension and they were human, human beings. And thank God for that because then we can learn from them, which is good. All right, any other questions, any other thoughts? Thank you for your contributions and the associations that you made with, with this. And I'm sure maybe hopefully you'll think of more um, over Shabbos that come to mind. And I hope you enjoy and have a great Shabbos and I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thanks, right, thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.